Okay. Dear colleagues, if I may have your attention, please be welcome and take your seats. Good to see you here. And uh, let's get started. We're going to have a shorter version of the scheduled meeting of the Libya inquiry on the surveillance and the mass surveillance because of the fact that Commissioner Reading won't make it. But anyhow, we have, ha we have, we we have uh, some points to go through. First, adopting the agenda. If no objections, we take it as adopted. Now, let's go for session one, which is the U.S. safe harbor information by the Commission of the assessment of the safe harbor. We are having here the sixth hearing of our Libya Committee inquiry, focusing on the impact of the U.S. surveillance programs on the right of EU citizens to the protection of personal data. UA data protection law contains provisions relating international transfers of personal data processed in the EU to third countries with the objective of ensuring the continuity of the protection afforded by the EU law where personal data are transferred. Several mechanisms are thereby used for that purpose. First, adequacy. Two, contracts. And three, binding corporate rules. As regards the first, the Commission has declared in 2000 the so-called adequacy of the safe harbor principles of the U.S. Department of Commerce with EU data protection standards. Second, as to the <coughs> contractual, well, let me, let me point out that this, this first issue of the adequacy rule has been always controversial, not only for the European Parliament, but also for data protection authorities, as we're going to, 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 to be hearing from our European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. Hastings. The second point is contractual clauses and binding corporate rules, which means that in addition, transfer to the U.S. take place under contracts entered into force between EU data controllers and U.S. importers, or more recently, by means of binding corporate rules for transfers made within a multinational group. However, mass surveillance programs conducted by US, U.S. intelligence services have a serious impact on the rights of citizens, on personal data which have been transferred to the U.S. The information published by the Guardian or their Spiegel indicate that private IT companies would have been requested to pass massive categories of personal data to the U.S. National Security Agency and other services. Yes, please. Some coffee, please. This raises questions on whether the tools employed to transfer personal data to U.S. companies meet or not the objective and requirements of EU law. In other words, we've got to check whether our personal data protected enough or not when transferred to the United States under the safe harbor agreement or the current standard contractual clauses established by the Commission. To consider these issues, the European Data Protection Supervisor and an independent consultant who has issued reports on the implementation of the safe harbor have been invited to share their views with us. Vice President Reading declined to attend the meeting today, so we express a disappointment that the Commission could not attend this hearing. The Commission announced in the Justice and Home Affairs Council in Vilnius that a report assessing self safe harbor would be ready by the autumn, 
by fall, which is now, it seems that the report would only be made public in December, somewhat later. So we are asking Vice President Redding to present this report in the Libya inquiry meeting of December the 9th. But since Vice President Redding is not attending this session, we're going to proceed directly to the second session devoted to the impact of the U.S. mass surveillance programs on the U.S. safe harbor. So, for the sake of the efficiency of the timing, the speakers will have 10 minutes each to make their statements and then floor for discussion, questionings. Let's, let's always keep in mind that this is about hearings, not about political statements. We should not rush into conclusions, but try to point out the questions that are to be answered specifically by the guest speakers that we are having in these sessions of the inquiry. So let's get started with the statements of the uh, people we have invited this evening. We'll get started by Dr. Inke Sommer, which is the uh, Landesbeauftragte für Datenschutz und Informationsfreiheit der Freien Hansestadt Bremen. Das ist richtig. That's it, richtig. Ganz richtig. And then we're having Mr. Christopher Connolly, which is a privacy advocate and researcher representing Galaxia, and Mr. Peter Hastings, which is our European Data Protection Supervisor. Uh, we will get started by Dr. Sommer and uh, then the following speakers. Please. Mrs. Sommer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear Mr. Chairman, dear members of the European pa uh, Parliament, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and I do this in the name of my colleagues, um, my German colleagues, for inviting me to speak to you about our exper experiences with the safe harbor decision. Um, the German data protection authorities used to criticize the safe harbor decision, and this is why we would have been very, um, yes, uh, uh, we would have uh, liked to know what uh, the European Commission um, will do about this um, safe harbor um, decision. And I think they will clarify um, some parts of the decision, and we will look forward to, what, uh, to the results of um, these ideas, but we consider, consider even the existing safe harbor decision as an efficient means, as a means, to suspend the transfer of personal data to U.S. companies in the current situation. We've got records about extensive access to personal data of European citizens by the, uh, the NSA without reasonable suspicion of wrongdoing. And we think that even now the safe harbor decision makes sure that access to personal data that is justified by arguments of national security can only be possible when first there's reasonable suspicion of wrongdoing. This is what we read in this decision. And second, the excess regards the principles of need, proportionality, and poor purpose limitation. And just to make it clear, we would really very much appreciate it um, if it would be clarified uh, that these points are within the decision. But we think, we have the opinion that um, these principles are already included in the safe harbor decision, and this is why we think we can use it to come to, to some, um, that, we, that we come to, uh, uh, to talk to, to uh, companies who really do these transfers. And um, 
I said we had many critical points about um, the safe harbor, but um, I think in using this uh, safe harbor decision, we really thought that there are two things that we really appreciate as um, data protection um, officers in this uh, safe harbor decision, and this is the first that um, the decision says that to, to suspend data transfers, um, data protection authorities do not need evidence that the safe harbor principles are violated, but there must be substantial likelihood. And this is, I think, a very uh, important point. And um, secondly, to suspend data transfers, it's not necessary that the data breach is done voluntarily. And I think these are very important uh, points for um, uh, data protection authorities to come to conclusions. And uh, I think we would very much like it if these um, principles would uh, stay in a safe harbor decision. And I think we, uh, later we will um, hear from Mr. Canali and uh, we will learn um, that U.S. American but also European data protection authorities did not do enough to control the safe harbor principles yet, even the weak ones we have at the moment. But um, in this situation of mass surveillance, the German data protection officers be began to try to change the situations and um, to begin with um, these proceedings. By now, um, many of my colleagues and me, we started an administrational proceedings to investigate whether we will suspend certain transfers of personal data or whether we won't. We will do individual, uh, individual decisions and uh, we, because we are, we are talking about individual cases and this is why I can't say what the re results will be, but uh, I think and that is um, very important just to, to ask, because um, in, in asking and in saying, now we, we see the moment that we begin to, to ask because of the mass uh, data surveillance, we, we begin to use the, uh, these, um, these uh, means we have by this um, safe harbor um, decision. Um, we had the result that um, we had many telephone calls from lawyers from the firms who really wanted to know what can we do. We really had the impression that the, um, this um, message we, ha we did in this press release, uh, we will start now, that this message really reached um, the people we wanted to reach. And um, I think that all of us have the impression that even the German companies we are talking to are very interested that the mass surveillance of European citizens comes to an end, and I think this is really the result it should have had, um, that, that we have at least in our, um, yes, in, in, our um, yes in, in what we want, that uh, uh, all, all the data protection officers have the goal that um, this uh, mass surveillance will stop, and I think we will use every means we have, and we use the, even the weak um, safe harbor um, decision we have, and this is what I wanted to say to you, and I, now I thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Now we move on to Mr. Christopher Connolly. You made it right on time. We're moving yes. now to hear from, from, from Mr. Connolly. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Members. Uh, I also would like to thank everyone for the opportunity to present today. Um, as we've heard, the Safe Harbour is a, uh, an agreement, but it's really a compromise agreement between two very different legal systems for protecting data. And as a result of that, like all compromises, it suffers from a, a series of important limitations. Um, my organisation, Galaxia, has uh, published uh, reports in 2008 and again in 2010 analysing the members of the safe harbour and uh, revealing significant areas of non-compliance and false claims. Um, obviously today the focus is uh, return to the safe harbour um, in a slightly different context, looking at mass surveillance. But what I would like to do today 
is to um, briefly give people an update on the type of conduct that you find in the safe harbour, um, and then I'll turn to some of the national security surveillance implications. Because of the very short time, I'll just mention the eight, the top eight issues um, which you would find if you looked at safe harbour membership at the moment. Um, there are many more. You can read our papers, and my own longer notes from tonight will be published by the committee as well. Issue number one is really just a reminder that the safe harbour is a very small, limited scheme. With the amount of profile the safe harbour has, you might imagine it was a comprehensive uh, privacy framework covering you know, large, um, uh, you know, a large bulk of uh, American organisations. But people need to remember that it specifically doesn't cover financial services, telecommunications, it doesn't cover um, large sections of energy, transport and media, and it never can because those organisations can't be regulated by the FTC in the US. Also, it's a voluntary framework and there are less than 3,000 current members once you take out false claims and duplicate entries in the safe harbour list. Many popular services in Europe, such as Instagram and TripAdvisor, have simply not volunteered to join the safe harbour. So it has these significant gaps. And even within the membership, you can limit your safe harbour coverage to just human resources data, or just consumer data, or just offline data. So the system, as you look at it, gets smaller and smaller and covers a smaller and smaller portion of data that is sent to the US. The second issue is that the, the safe harbour is transient. European stakeholders may be used to having a local privacy law that applies all of the time to all of your data forever. That's simply not the case with the safe harbour. You're only protected while the organisation is a member of the safe harbour and it's only enforceable while they make a promise in their privacy policy that they're a member of the safe harbour. More than 1,000 organisations have left the safe harbour in the time which I've been doing research on the safe harbour. And they also leave the list. Hundreds of them have just disappeared from the list, so there's no archive of who was members in the past. Of course, consumers who have provided their information to a safe harbour firm, who then leaves, are not told that the firm has left, and it's a very unusual situation for them. The, the firm might have changed over to a consent approach, but they might have no idea. The third issue, and probably the most significant one, is that many claims of safe harbour membership are false. These false claims have a very significant impact on the consumer because you might be lured into dealing with a particular organisation. It could be um, that a, an agency who has your information has decided to do the right thing and only send it to a safe harbour organisation. But where that claim is false, there is in fact no protection. Galexia's studies in 2008 found that there were 208 false claims. In 2010, it had grown to 331 false claims. And today, sorry, in September, so we're a few days past that now, the number of total false claims of safe harbour membership was 427. Providing the list of these false claims to organisations such as the Department of Commerce and the, um, the Federal Trade Commission appears to have had little impact to date. The level of false claims still remains high. And within those 427 organisations, you will find large high-profile organisations, household names in Europe with hundreds of millions of customers. Consumers and privacy advocates have complained for many years about these false claims without success. Issue number four. The safe harbour relies heavily on trust marks and seals, visual symbols of safe harbour membership, safe harbour compliance. It's a great way to attract consumers and organisations in and these visual symbols usually have the words EU or European Union or even the European flag on the seal, this visual attraction. But again, these are simply very low quality and 
false representations of the actual membership of the safe harbour. More than 25% of the organisations currently making false claims have a link to a Trustmark scheme. In addition, over 10% of the organisations who currently make a false claim of safe harbour membership display on their websites the US Department of Commerce safe harbour logo. The fifth issue is that many organisations fail to comply with principle seven, enforcement of the safe harbour framework, because they don't provide information to consumers about your dispute resolution options. The safe harbour documentation requires you to tell your customers where a dispute can be resolved, who by, and the contact details. This is the largest cause of non-compliance with the safe harbour, as 30% of organisations don't supply that information. Unfortunately, there has been a case about this in the US, the Federal Trade Commission case of Director's Desk in 2009. Director's Desk did not disclose who their dispute resolution provider was to consumers. And in fact, if you did manage to find out who it was, it was the AAA, the American Arbitration Association, which at the time charged $4,000 to file a complaint. Unfortunately, the FTC took no action against Director's Desk in that complaint in 2009, and that set a poor precedent. It's, in my view, the low point of safe harbour oversight in the period in which I've been studying it. It's very difficult to see how that situation can now be turned around without significant intervention. Issue number six is that many of the selected dispute resolution providers are too expensive for consumers. And I'll provide more information about that in the paper. But for example, 461 current members have selected the American Arbitration Association. 153 members have selected the Judicial Arbitration Mediation Service. They both cost thousands of dollars just to start a complaint. A very small number have joined a scheme which only charges $200 per complainant um, within the uh, AAA group but there's only 75 people in that, organisations in that scheme to date. The seventh issue is that some important software downloads are excluded from safe harbour dispute resolution and therefore safe harbour protection, even where the parent organisation is in the safe harbour and does belong to a dispute resolution scheme. And of course, the internet is changing. We now rely more on downloaded software and apps than we rely on visiting the main website of an organisation. And many, many of those privacy policies exclude their downloaded software from dispute resolution in the safe harbour. Issue number eight, and the final issue, is that stakeholders have an unrealistic expectation about FTC enforcement action, enforcement by the Federal Trade Commission. The potential role of the FTC is always raised in discussions and it's in the privacy policies of most safe harbour members. We are regulated by the FTC. But it gives a false sense of oversight and governance and hope. For example, previous FTC action in relation to false claims of the safe harbour has been very limited. Only six cases have been filed. No sanctions were imposed. None of the organisations was large. None of the organisations belonged to a Trustmark scheme. Expectations of FTC oversight need to be much more realistic because it's just so different to dealing with European data protection commissioners, especially for an ordinary consumer. If an ordinary consumer contacted the FTC, they may receive no response, no acknowledgement, no reasons for a decision, no case reference number, no timeline for processing, etc. It's very different to what you might be used to in Europe. Now I'll briefly turn to relevance to national security surveillance. There's three key areas here. The first is coverage. It's important to note that many organisations that are targets of surveillance are not and cannot be members of the safe harbour. Uh, financial records, travel records, significant portions of voice and data traffic carried by US telecommunications providers are all excluded from safe harbour jurisdiction, let alone voluntary safe harbour membership. The second point on national security is that there is in fact a national security limitation 
in the safe harbour documentation. The agreement allows, but does not require, a specific limitation to be added to privacy policies to limit the principles for the purposes of national security. No further detail or guidelines has ever been provided on that limitation. Around 1 to 2 per cent of Safe Harbour members have included national security in their privacy policies. They tend to be the organisations who have cut and pasted the whole Safe Harbour agreement into their privacy policies, and it just happens to have the word national security. I don't think they've actually thought through using that limitation. It's just there because it's a copy and paste. The general impression provided to consumers when you read Safe Harbour privacy policies, and I can assure you that I have read more Safe Harbour privacy policies than anyone else, is that disclosures will only be made to government agencies in very limited circumstances in response to specific lawful requests. And even where national security is mentioned, there's no indication, obviously, of any form of mass surveillance or mass disclosure. And finally, dispute resolution. A really obvious weakness here is that the dispute resolution provider for European consumers is the one chosen by the US Safe Harbour member. It could be the Direct Marketing Association, it could be Trustee or Triple B, or it could be a private mediation service. They're all completely inappropriate for dealing with an issue of a national security disclosure. A consumer is very unlikely to want to go to the Direct Marketing Association um, to discuss a disclosure to a law enforcement agency or a national security organisation. However, at the moment, that's the only choice they have. This will need to be addressed, obviously, by a change, and hopefully this will come up in the review to the framework. A revised safe harbour framework could require all disputes relating to national security or law enforcement disclosures to be resolved by the European data protection authorities rather than these private bodies. And there is a precedent for this in the framework itself. All human resources disputes must be resolved in Europe by European data protection authorities, even if the safe harbour member has chosen another body, such as the Direct Marketing Association, for their consumer disputes. So we have a precedent. A brief conclusion. I would like to warn that it would be dangerous to rely on the safe harbour to manage any aspect of the specific national security issue we face now without first addressing the broader issues of false claims and non-compliance. At the moment, for every seven public claims of safe harbour membership, one is a lie. That's an unacceptable level. It's dangerous for consumers. It's stayed at that level for the entire history of the safe harbour without any improvement or any change. Finally, there should be some discussion about whether or not the safe harbour has served its purpose whether or not it's now time to move on. It was a limited compromise stopgap measure that has drifted for 13 years without ever delivering higher levels of compliance. Are there alternatives that could deliver a better outcome? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. That was a thorough explanation of the deficiencies of the Safe Harbour Agreement from your perspective. Now let's hear. Let's hear. Uh, from our European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. No? Yes, yes, Mr. Hastings. Yes, you chaired the uh, Article 29 Working Party by the time the agreement was done. So we are about to hear from you before opening the floor from the first rapporteurs and shadow rapporteurs and then the rest of the members. Please, Mr. Hastings, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, thanks for the invitation. The focus of your program today is on the U.S. safe harbor and other instruments for international data transfers. But I would like to use this opportunity to also make some general remarks on what is at stake and what should be done in view of the various disclosures on electronic mass surveillance of European citizens. When the first installments of the NSA story had just been published in June, we immediately expressed our concerns about the possible serious implications for the privacy and other fundamental rights of European citizens. We've asked 
for a profound explanation and clarification of the facts. We have insisted on immediate and adequate action, and we have been following the ongoing story ever since. Let me say that I am grateful for the steps taken by Vice President Reding on behalf of the European Commission, and I very much appreciate the strong language used by Mrs. Merkel and other European leaders. As you know, the Article 29 Working Party is currently involved in an assessment of the various surveillance programs, the consequences they may have for the data protection of European citizens, and the implications this will then have for international transfers. Our staff are actively contributing to this analysis, for instance, <laughs> on the applicability of European law and the different issues arising in that context. At its last plenary meeting, only a few days ago, the Article 29 uh, Working Party gave a mandate to its relevant subgroups to continue their analysis of the various programs and report back to the plenary in December. The Working Party will then very likely be able to adopt a position on all relevant aspects of the matter. Although some of the facts are still not, and may be, in the end, they will never be sufficiently clear, this will not prevent us from investigating all relevant scenarios and analyzing their consequences. Moreover, we also hope to benefit at some point from the findings and conclusions of other ongoing work. At EDPS, we are pr particularly concerned how European institutions and bodies may have been affected and we will be examining the possible need to increase current levels of information security, certainly also in view of the recent Belgagom story. In this context, we are intensifying our contacts with all competent services. Now, the three most striking points that we know at this stage are, one, the scale of the monitoring that has been going on, two, the number of private actors, including well-known internet giants that have apparently been involved, either actively or passively, and three, the development of weaknesses and backdoors in encryption with far-reaching, perverse effects and very great damage to the public trust. At this stage, there seems to be little doubt that we are facing an existential challenge to our fundamental rights and liberties. We must therefore be prepared to draw a line in the sand. Strong safeguards for our privacy will need to be negotiated and adopted. And if not, we will need to consider suspending data flows and suspending or terminating existing agreements for data exchange. At the same time, at the same time, it may be possible to develop more intelligent answers, turning a crisis into opportunities and using it positively to our advantage. It seems to me that a first conclusion should be that there is now even more reason to decide on a swift adoption of the General Data Protection Regulation that will allow us to address the private actors much more actively than under current legal frameworks. That means stronger arrangements for responsibility and accountability and for stronger and more consistent supervision and enforcement across the European Union. It will thus also be essential to extend the scope of European law to ensure a level playing field for all those active on the European market. The regulation should also provide for a mechanism such as the famous Article 42 of a previous version so as to address the now real possibility of a conflict of international law where jurisdictions have conflicting views 
of their political, uh, sorry, their public interest. The basic principle should be that all data flows must be in line with European law unless a binding international agreement has provided otherwise or a judicial or supervisory authority has granted an exemption. Another point of attention is that an additional protocol to the Cybercrime Convention, as currently under discussion in the context of the Council of Europe, may well create space for unwarranted access by intelligence services to data stored in other jurisdictions. This issue has also been raised in the opinion of the Libe Committee very recently for ITRE on the strategy for cloud computing. We should do our utmost <coughs> to ensure that this additional protocol will not be adopted. The NSA story has also other implications, which I can now only mention very briefly. If we are to draw a, land, a line in the sand, it should be to assert our European data protection culture, which does not discriminate on grounds of nationality. We cannot accept a distinction between US persons and non-US persons, which leaves all European citizens without any proper legal protection. Another problem is the apparent large-scale collection of data, subject only to restrictions on their use. This is totally incompatible with our emphasis on principles of necessity and proportionality when restrictions are imposed on fundamental rights. So let me be clear, therefore. We must now make a stand it is really now or never. In this respect, it would not be so difficult to build a solid agenda for transatlantic discussion and, where necessary, negotiation on the way ahead. I would like to come back to this point at the end of my remarks. Now, let me turn to the U.S. safe harbor as one of the specific subjects for this hearing. Here, I would like to make my remarks in three steps. First, the concept of adequacy. Second, the regular U.S. safe harbor. And finally, the exception for national security and similar interests. The notion of an adequate level of protection was included in Article 25 of the Directive in order to ensure data flows with third countries to be subject to sufficient protection, depending on the circumstances of the case, but not necessarily equivalent to the level of protection within the EU. That is a pragmatic approach reflecting the diversity of legal cultures in the world. The notion of adequacy has further been developed in an opinion of the Article 29 Working Party, that's Working Party <laughs> Document 12, adopted in 1998, two years before the Safe Harbor was adopted. Uh, this document has been the basis for all Commission decisions on adequacy, including the one on the U.S. Safe Harbor. Adequate protection, as referred to, requires conformity with a core of content principles and some procedural or enforcement requirements in order to ensure effective compliance, support and help to data subjects and appropriate redress. In other words, <clears throat> an objective or functional approach. Among the content principles mentioned in the opinion are purpose limitation, data quality and proportionality, transparency, data security, rights of access and correction, and restrictions on onward transfers. However, the opinion also mentioned that exceptions could apply, which, and I quote, should be in line with Article 13 of the Directive. That's mentioned on page 6 of the opinion. This Article 13 of the Directive allows exemptions to protection for national or public security to the extent necessary in a democratic society, subject to safeguards. Although this provision does not apply in a third country, it is here relied on by analogy. 
In the context of contractual provisions to provide adequacy, the opinion then also discusses the problem of overriding law. That's page 21-22. And one of the conclusions is that, and I quote again, countries where the powers of state authorities to access information go beyond those permitted by internationally accepted standards of human rights protection will not be safe destinations for transfers based on contractual clauses. That's a conclusion on page 23. But that, of course, also applies to adequacy findings. The U.S. safe harbor has been controversial from the very beginning. The chairman already mentioned this. The Article 29 Working Party has adopted, and he also mentioned to my, my role in this, a series of very critical opinions in the course of the negotiations between the Commission and the U.S. Department of Commerce. But once the negotiations were concluded and the Commission decision on the safe harbor was adopted, the Working Party has invested in bringing it to life and making it work better. Let me clearly say that the emphasis of safe harbor work for European data protection authorities is at the national level, for obvious reasons. There are only commercial companies there. European institutions and bodies sometimes transfer personal data to third countries, but this usually does not involve the safe harbor. However, from a strategic perspective, the evaluation is, of course, quite different. So we have been closely involved at the different stages of the process. Now, it is fair to say that the safe harbor made a slow, if not a very slow, start. But it has gradually picked up momentum. And now it covers a substantial part of what is often referred to as commercial privacy. We believe that substantial improvements have been made and that most of the issues have now been settled. And that is particularly true for the more active role of the U.S. Department of Commerce in the self-certification process and for the role of the Federal Trade Commission in enforcement. So the regular safe harbor does have certain merits. But what remains problematic is the lack of a comprehensive overview of safe harbor practice and experience together with sufficiently reliable statistics. For this reason, a privacy contact group was established with representatives from both sides, which has been active for a number of years. At this stage, the working party, 29 working party, is looking forward to the assessment report, which has been announced by the European Commission. According to the introductory part of the safe harbor principles, that's Annex 1 to the Commission decision of July 2000, adherence to, this, to these principles may be limited, and I quote, to the extent necessary to meet national security, public interest, or law enforcement requirements. And there is a second leg to this paragraph which refers to overriding law. It is good to keep in mind that we are dealing here with exceptions to fundamental rights which the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights always interpret restrictively. Moreover, the text quoted is carefully crafted language with the words to the extent necessary used a number of times. Whereas in the current situation, we seem to be confronted with systematic non-compliance with safe harbor principles in all cases where companies may have been approached under any of the mass surveillance programs. And we don't know exactly what has happened. Both sides may well disagree on whether this exception in fact applied. In any case, this question should be answered in the negative if we assume, as we do, that the relevant surveillance programs were excessive. Again, it is likely that both sides will disagree about that very conclusion. Now, this could be a reason to invoke Article 4 of the Commission decision, according to which that decision, and I quote, may be adapted at any time 
in the light of experience with its implementation and or if the level of protection provided by the principles is overtaken by the requirements of U.S. legislation. Any relevant evidence could, for instance, be provided by a commission evaluation report, such as the one expected by the end of the year. Any further steps should then be taken by the Commission together with the Article 31 Committee of Member States' representatives. In that case, the focus will be more on how to deal with excessive surveillance or perhaps how to deal with disagreement on that very subject then more than on the effectiveness of the safe harbor as an instrument for <coughs> adequate protection. But the Commission report could address both and thus provide substantial input for discussion and negotiation with the U.S. side. In that context, let me say that we could not throw away safe harbor as such without investigating the scope for improvements. An agenda for improvements of the safe harbor in the light of experience, as the text specifically allows, could be combined with other issues and concerns either in the context of law enforcement cooperation, ongoing negotiations on the umbrella agreement, or trade, negotiations are ongoing, or in the long term, a perspective of a new international agreement with principles for lawful surveillance as the German government has proposed and the International Conference of Data Commissioners has recently endorsed. In this context, we should also... Mr. Mr. Hastings, I would, I would like you Thank to you. rush into I'm conclusions close to the end. because we are exceeding, obviously, Thank you. the, the timing that was scheduled for this part of the session. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm close to the end. In this context, we should also not fully exclude that a significant part of the solution may come from the U.S. side. It may be recommendations from the U.S. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which is currently doing an investigation, or from the internal expert group established by the U.S. Administration, or more transparency, or other meaningful safeguards. In any case, and that's my last statement, it would be wise to keep all options open and at the same time also explore all relevant possibilities for a constructive engagement. Thank you. And I'm, I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. Thank you. We, we, we appreciate, of course, every contribution. The first uh, statement refrained to the timing. The other two have exceeded, obviously. We appreciate them both, of course, but that will force us right from the start to have a reminder of the timing, of the time frame, so that we can have a first round of questions. We get started by our rapporteur here, Mr. Claude Moraes. Then we will follow with the shadow rapporteurs. We will have a first round of answers and then open further floor for the members who are willing to make additional questionings, which of course is not short. So all of you please, all of you please have it in mind so that we refrain to questionings and answers. The shorter the better. Yes, Mrs. Intvill. No, I was just going to ask because we aren't we going to do the same arrangement as last time? Yeah. One question, one answer. No, no. I, I suggest I suggest every ah. every rapporteur and shadow rapporteurs should address them three, all three, all three together, and then a common round of answers. Excuse me. We we did this last time. We had arranged between the or or agreed between the political groups to do it this way, and it worked well last time. So I would be in favour of. Uh, following the same arrangements, and I get the feeling that... Question so, answer, yeah. question and answer, every, 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 rapporteur and shadow rapporteurs, questions and answers, okay? That'll, that'll take more time, but it's okay. So first, Claude. So that means, that means to go really quick, really short questions. Is that right? Of course. Right. <laughs> the mic. Okay. No, this one. Okay. I'll use the chairman's microphone. Is that okay? <laughs> this is not working for some reason. 
Okay, the microphone's not working, the NSA is at work. <laughs> not that I'm important, but okay. this has gone off now. Okay. Now you got it, okay? <laughs> okay, can I just apologise to the United States for the duration of the inquiry? It's gone off again. Right, okay. Um, right, quick. Um, sorry, I've got to go fast because everyone wants to ask questions and some members are leaving. Um, it's clear that the um, safe harbour has been controversial from the beginning. I'm sorry that the Commissioner is not here to respond to the, to the various suggestions, particularly since what's been happening since 2010, because I think that would have been part of why we put this, this um, session together. So I apologise to our speakers and members for that, uh, for the reasons that the Chairman mentioned. Can I just then pose some quick questions rather than this, some of the statement I was going to make? First of all, to Dr. Sommer, we were all following what you said in June and the statement you made in June, not just the German members, but all of us, because um, what you did after the Snowden allegations was to react very strongly, in my opinion. And um, you wanted to halt data transfers then. So my, my question is, um, and obviously the Commissioner is not here, but I expected her to be here, but if, if after the review has happened um, and you're still unsatisfied with that review, what will you do? I mean, are you proposing to, hypothetically, but are you proposing to then halt um, uh, or suspend the safe harbour um, agreement? Secondly, what do you think um, Germany should do and other member states should do in the current situation? For example, suspend data flows or conduct national inspections of companies using safe harbour um, or just assess if national data protection law has been breached or safe harbour principles are being observed. I mean, what, what do you think we should be doing in, in this sort of interim? Um, that's my question to you. Should I pose the other questions course, to the other two? Yeah, um, the Galaxia report of 2008 to Mr Connolly is so rich in, in detail, but... Um, I'm just going to cut things short because I know many colleagues want to ask about this. So let me just cut to the chase because you investigated this in great detail. So let me just ask because it occurred to me that um, this was the example we raised uh, from industry and it was a very objective analysis of what was happening. So let me just ask a quick question then. Um, what is your analysis after the whole Galaxia report? Um, do you think a complete re renegotiation of the Safe Harbour Framework is necessary or a d completely different mechanism? I mean, you, you went right around the edges of this, but let me ask you for a political analysis, if you can do that, because this is the most detailed an analysis of where the breach has happened. Um, it was objective and it came from industry. Uh, so tell us what your opinion is. Um, and I'll leave it there so other colleagues can ask their questions. Mr. So Thank you. Um, yes, uh, as you saw in, 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 in what I said, was that we had to, so, uh, two ways of react, reacting um, um, concerning a safe harbor um, decision. We said we, we still find it's, it's weak, and uh, this is why we really want uh, the Commission to, to talk to uh, the U.S. Uh, authorities about this because we, we think um, that there should be more. But in the same time, we said we want to use it. And um, I, I think uh, that still we have the possibility, we, we can say we, we interpret uh, the safe harbor decision in a way that really we can stop these uh, transfers now. We, we certainly have to look at every single case etc but but we can use it but we have to make sure and we have to show that we we are concerned and that we we have to show that we do something and i think that that this um, safe harbor is a very good um good means to to say this is one point we want to discuss where, where, or you uh, the the uh, european uh, the european commission wants to discuss with the us um, authorities and we see that Obviously, safe harbor couldn't prevent what happened. And so I think it's, it's very hard to say, yes, um, I think uh, after everything is um, negotiated um, again, we will re react in this or this way. We, I, I can't do this, uh, so, certainly not. But I think what really is very important is that, that we really show 
as Europe uh, reaction on what happened. One uh, or, or small um, work with us is, is to say, so we have in Bremen, I have um, some, some companies and I talk to them and every one of my colleagues does it as well. And we, we look at the cases and we say maybe um, you, you can't uh, prove that um, wh what you do belongs to a safe harbor, and so you, you have to stop it. And, and um, mostly it's, it's very important to come to a um, conversation about this, about, uh, to a discussion. And this is what we really realized after our press lead release, that um, the companies um, started to, uh, to, to do conversation about this point. And, this point, and I think maybe you are not content with the answer, but, but I think that um, it, the, the re result must that Europe shows um, what we have wasn't enough to prevent what happened. Thank you, Frau Sommer. Please try to make it in two minutes, the reply, so that we can have further time for discussion. Thank you. In, uh, thank you for the question. In, in my um, longer paper, which uh, I, I've submitted, I do make some recommendations for potential change to the safe harbour improvements. So obviously I believe that it can be saved, it can be improved. Um, obviously the levels of false claims and non-compliance are at extremely high levels at the moment. Um, th that doesn't have to be the case. And the, the key recommendations I make there are about trying to find opportunities for um, for European stakeholders to have some control, whether it's joint oversight, uh, I recommend a, a harbour master, if you like, for the safe harbour. Um, we've actually, you know, European input into that. Um, but definitely uh, there should be European approval of things like these trust marks, which have the European map or the, <laughs> you know, or the flag on them. There should be European approval of ADR schemes. If Obviously, you would never select an organization that cost $4,000 or that was, uh, you know, wasn't independent, etc. So there's plenty of opportunity for improvement. Now, no, Mr. Hastings, any, any, no, no, no questions were made. So that we move on to Mr. Foss as Shadow Rapporteur, your turn. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank. Thank you. I probably have to wait for people to put their headphones on. Also, noch mal. So, many thanks to all three of you. Uh, following uh, these, uh, following what the speakers have uh, said, I can't see how we can help the European citizen with this if it's managed in such a lax manner as is the case at the moment. Now, it might have been justified initially to take this lax approach just to get the thing uh, up and running, but now we have uh, dangers from two particular sides, this massive data uh, gathering from the various uh, businesses who, and who are analyzing these data more and more. And then there is the spying uh, on the part of the nation states. And so we have to uh, say that this agreement now that dates um, from uh, 80, 18, the period 89 to 2000, that this is no longer um, applicable in the current times or appropriate. So what level of improvement do we need? What recommendations would you like to make? Uh, Mr. Connolly, I haven't uh, read your document yet. Could one uh, say that we're going from, that we are operating on the basis of an autonomous uh, citizen who just needs more access to information, more transparency and uh, legal protection, or do we need more monitoring? Uh, in the USA of the various businesses, or do we need a better um, decision about what is uh, proportional with regard to these uh, data and their uh, analysis? Or should the FTC uh, monitor it and then or would the European Data Protection Authority allow that? Or should we just say that the situation has changed so much to such an extent that we need a fully uh, revamped um, agreement 
um, between the, it, within Europe, within the US, and all of this against the background of the uh, notion that we have two different approaches on both sides of Atla the Atlantic. And so I'd like to know how can we improve the situation? What degree of improvement do we need? Good question. I think um, what, what's important is that uh, the, uh, the, the degree of, um, of protection of data, uh, of our, our uh, data protection rights is be, uh, high enough. And we, we try to say, yes, we see it in this safe harbor yet. But we look very much for clarification that not only uh, the German data protection uh, officers, but, but everybody sees it in, in a regulation. And what kind of regulation it would be, I think, for, for the, the right of uh, data protection is, uh, it's, it's, uh, if it's good enough, um, it, it could be a safe harbor um, decision. If it's good enough, uh, if it's not good enough, uh, we, we should uh, change the, the means, I think. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, the, the degree of, of compliance is, I, I believe, very low just at the moment. Um, partly not just because there are a lot of organisations who are not compliant or who are making false claims, but because compared to 2008, these organisations are bigger, they're household names, they have hundreds of millions of customers. Um, I mean each, not collectively. <laughs> so yes, I think the degree, uh, the severity of the issue is very high at the moment. Um, and you know, similar to Mr. Hustings's call, um, this is really now or never. Uh, it can't be left to drift uh, for a longer period with, um, with that level of compliance. Uh, I have already said I'm a believer in reform um, rather than uh, abandoning uh, the, the approach, um, but all alternatives, you know, should be on the table while that reform is negotiated. Yeah, um, I fully agree with Mr. Voss that the combination of uh, internet service providers, monitoring users, and excessive monitoring uh, of uh, surveillance of the use of the internet is, is a combination which is very explosive. But to solve this, we should not focus on safe harbor, but on the making the European data protection framework stronger. Uh, making sure that it applies to all those it should apply. And then that's the first step. Then that means that European law will, directly, will be directly applicable to whoever is active on the European market, to put it very simple, either established in Europe, either elsewhere. But in both scenarios, there will be a need for data exchange with third countries, and some of it will go to the United States. Now, for that purpose, uh, adequacy principles, adequacy instruments, contracts, and yes, also um, a safe harbor uh, come to mind. Now, um, I think we, we have benefited, we, both sides, have benefited from Galaxia's report in 2008, which was very detailed, and has been used both by the um, uh, Department of Commerce, the Federal Trade Commission, and, and by the Article 29 uh, group to shake up the system. And it may well be that the, the further recommendations could be fed in to what the Commission is, is doing now. But I think we should be keeping these uh, ideas apart. Um, there is no merit in uh, handicapping those who have no uh, part in any unlawful surveillance whatsoever, but we should need, uh, should we, we need to fill the, the gap at the backside of, 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 of uh, also safe harbour, that is, address the excessive surveillance head on and discuss with the United States government um, uh, what, what is, is acceptable and is not acceptable. And that will not be easy, but that is the approach 
uh, we should be brave enough to, uh, to, to approach. And if I speak about a, a, um, an intelligent agenda, then th there is something to win for the US and for us. And we can turn some of the obvious deficiencies into advantages, and I've mentioned a few. Thank you. Now, Mrs. Intveld, your turn. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would uh, thank you to the, the speakers, uh, first of all, uh, and also for your, your efforts uh, in this area. I would essentially like to ask some questions about your view on um, why there has not been more of a reaction. I believe the report of Mr. Connolly has been circulating since 2008. I think you said um, we've been discussing it here. I've just checked. I, I submitted parliamentary questions in 2010. The European Commission at the time promised that there would be uh, an evaluation in 2011. We are now at the end of 2013. Uh, why has the reaction been so tepid? Do you think it is lack of political will? Is it naivete? Um, I would also like to understand the report. Has it been commissioned by the Commission? Was it at the request of the Commission? Because there were some question marks. Uh, it was actually a bit of a mystery at some point. It, it was a very famous report, but we couldn't find it on the website anymore. Um, secondly, I, I'm interested. I'm I'm, I'm very pleased with the very critical uh, attitude of the, 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 the Bremen DPA, but I'm just wondering why the DPAs Europe-wide have not reacted to this more strongly. I mean, there have always been people asking questions, but they were, you know, lone voices. Um, and I, I, I also think um, that although your, your efforts are, are very, um, uh, you know, I admire it strongly, it is a stopgap solution. If you have to look at every single case, then you, know, you might as well do away with safe harbor altogether because the whole point was that it wasn't necessary uh, to look at every single case. And then to the EDPS, um, you say uh, we shouldn't get rid of safe harbor. That's essentially also what Mr. Connolly says. At the same time, it seems to me that the, the, uh, the, the security that it offers now uh, is so unreliable um, and so uneven that you know you cannot depend on it and therefore the whole essence is gone and the last question in particular to the EDPS um, you know I'm all in favor of national security and public interest but um, the definition of national security and public interest has become so broad that you know it covers almost everything you know it's probably in the interest of national security to spy on Jan Albrecht and myself for example so you know if we accept that, then again, it completely undermines the whole principle of safe harbor. Frau Sommer. At his first reaction, this is what we don't, uh, don't want to, to accept, that this is really uh, the principle in the safe harbor, that this uh, national security issues are can be understood like this in a democratic society. It can't. This is what was meant, what we think and we want to, to stress, in the, um, yes, in the safe harbor decision. This cannot be meant by national security where there isn't uh, looking at a single case and the suspicion that uh, looking all over all, this is not uh, national uh, security meant in a, in a democratic state. And uh, this is why we, yes, we, we certainly um, try to use this, uh, this means we have, and we have to apologize for doing it just right now because it's too late. You're, you're, um, we should have used it earlier in, in other cases, maybe. It's, um, maybe that this would have, be, uh, have been a better reaction from um, uh, our uh, data protection authorities on this report. We, had, we could have uh, re reacted earlier as well. And certainly this is our, our duty always to look at the cases. This is our, our, our claim. We, um, if we, do, uh, po uh, we don't do politics, this is your job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there were two questions there. The, the first is, um, you know, w what has happened since the report was released? Um, obviously, there were some reactions. Uh, the, the FTC took action against six of the organisations um, after we sent them the list of over 200. Um, and it, it does seem that, you know, that was 
just enough, it was the minimum amount of enforcement action to take the pressure off any further reforms or improvement to, to the safe harbour, which was unfortunate. Um, there was also a lot of uh, discussions. Uh, there was a joint workshop between um, the, uh, the European Commission and uh, the Department of Commerce on the safe harbour. Um, and, you know, at the, at the time I was very critical of the workshop, uh, partly because um, even though I was the author of the report, I, I wasn't asked to attend. Um, but also because in order to register um, for that conference, you had to register at a website, an outsourced website, which was in my report as a false claimant of Safe Harbour membership and had a trustee seal saying EU Safe Harbour member and they hadn't been a member for two years. And I mean, to their credit, the Department of Commerce did remove that seal within uh, 48 hours of being told about it. But you asked what happened since the report. Um, and secondly, the, the motivation was this report commission. No, no one has paid for any of this research. It's independent research. Uh, you can probably tell I'm Australian originally. I live in the UK now. Um, the motivation for the research was that uh, a similar approach to safe harbour was being proposed for APEC. Um, and uh, uh, privacy, consumer advocates, researchers, etc., um, wanted to know more about the safe harbour if it was going to be imposed on you know, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, etc. And that was why the report was commissioned. And why it might seem quite, distance, quite a distance initially from the European debate. Thank you. Now, Ralbrecht, your turn. Thank you very much. Um, Would you? No, Mr. Sorry. Oh, well, um, may, maybe briefly, yes, because uh, the way Mr. Connolly describes the aftermath of his report is not really what I recall. Um, th th my understanding is, in, in fact, clear recollection is that the report led to very substantial shake-up of the um, of the self-certification process. Um, uh, that is improvements in the Department of Commerce, um, much more robust, and also uh, it is now standard practice of the Federal Trade Commission, and, and uh, this was confirmed to me only again a few weeks ago in Warsaw, that all, in all cases, they check the safe harbor status, uh, etc. But that, that, that's perhaps not the right emphasis, because there are some things which should be better. Uh, the way to deal with this is to distinguish between the merits of safe harbor per se and the big issue which is now on the table. There I think that the alley of Article 3, which Mr. Sommer is referring to, has a problem in, in the sense that it, it, it assumes that an individual safe harbor right is misbehaving, to keep it very simple. What is here is that there is an overwhelming black cloud of public uh, uh, security, state security surveillance uh, threatening um, the, uh, all, all safe harbor rights. So it is a, an issue of Article 4. And this is why I suggested that in the light of experience, it is the appropriate way forward uh, for the Commission, and I've suggested steps. And there is finally nothing in my comments, nothing at all, which sounds like accepting the mass surveillance or the excessive use of the public security exception. But it is simply a fact that very likely uh, the Europeans and the Americans di will disagree about what it means. We, we understand this in the light of the case law in Strasbourg and Luxembourg, mainly Strasbourg, which uh, takes a completely different approach. So there is a lot to be discussed, and, and, and there we have to, to address. This is, is another matter. Now, Herr Albrecht, your turn. Thank you. Um, first of all, I mean, what we have to do here is to inquire on the mass surveillance and on the question how we can protect uh, our citizens from uh, unproportionate and also in the illegal uh, surveillance activities, uh, which obviously happened. So I think drawing uh, on the words just said by Mr. Hastings, it's about the question also 
if something could be happening under the framework of uh, an agreement or declaration like safe harbor, which is not in line with our legal framework. So uh, that would be, first of all, my first question um, uh, would be, what should we include in the draft regulation when we point out on the consequences of the safe harbor application, what should we put into the regulation to safeguard that, that, that will not happen? Because that is what we can do and what we have an impact on. I would like that, to ask that to all of you. And then uh, two small other questions. First of all, uh, to uh, Ms. Sommer on the authorities. Uh, I mean, can you exclude in the current situation that there are massive breaches to data protection, uh, to EU data protection rules, somehow legitimated or legalized by the safe harbor decision. Uh, and a question uh, to, the, um, uh, to Mr. Colony, um, perhaps you can answer it, I don't know. Um, would you say that um, safe harbor could lead to uh, uh, to a dis disadvantage also in competition to EU uh, companies um, when it comes to the different frameworks on both sides of the Atlantic and the application of the Safe Harbor Agreement. Now, oh, Soma. I, I'm not very uh, sure whether I, I caught you right, but, but I, I understood that uh, whether if we did um, uh, did a decision and, uh, and prohibited uh, transfer to U.S. data from – no, no, just – sorry. No, so uh, if at the moment you can exclude that there is massive breach to data protection laws uh, via the Safe Harbor Agreement. Yeah, then you have to say it in Deutsch, sagen. sorry. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to have to say it off, uh, in German whether you can exclude that under the safe harbor agreement there are massive breaches of law being legitimated. Massive... Um I, I didn't stress it, uh, stress it, it enough. Um, we think that we have in the safe harbor um, decision, we have a means to say stop it and to, to have this uh, impact on, on companies who, who say, oh, so uh, we, we stop this, uh, this transfer and so on, that we, we really uh, um, criticize what, what are the, the measures. But we think even with this weak um, safe harbor, we use, we have not, no many means, but we use the, this one. And um, to answer the, the first question, for example, we have an, in this um, principles of safe harbor, we have um, a principle for security. It's uh, called um, that um, the organizations must take uh, precautions um, to protect um, from unauthorized exact access, access. And it, it must be clear that, uh, clarified that um, I think this is a very, very good stress uh, we really can say if you um, don't protect your networks um, in, in a good way and you can't uh, really um, help um, the, if, if there is uh, influence um, by national security and, uh, agency or what, it is really a breach of this safe harbor. If, if it could be made clear in this, um, this um, uh, principle of security, this would help for example, and would, would help to make clear, to clarify, and we say it's just clear, clarification because we see it yet, yet in these principles, um, to, to make sure that um, in a democratic state, um, national security cannot be defined as we can go inside. Sorry. Thank you. Now, Mr. Connolly, would you add? Uh, just, <coughs> so just briefly, you, you asked if there could potentially be any disadvantage on a competition um, point of view uh, between obviously European companies who are having to comply with quite um, detailed and strict privacy law and uh, their competitors in the US who simply say we are a member of a safe harbour. Um, 
it, it is an issue, especially because of the levels of non-compliance and false claims, but it shouldn't be an issue. It should be like all other tests of adequacy. We really should have a level playing field or something close to a level playing field. Um, I would just point out, though, that the consumer protection issues are much more serious than concerns about competition, um, and I think any solutions need to prioritise uh, privacy protection for individuals uh, rather than pursuing you know, industrial policy um, and, uh, and, and other solutions for European businesses. Yes, uh, I would think that a safe harbour as it stands now does not allow and certainly not justify uh, mass uh, surveillance as we see it presently happening. Uh, the, the problem is that it is happening nevertheless. And that is the consequence of a difference in public policy and law between the United States and Europe. So what we should be doing, first of all, is reinforce our own frameworks so that we have leverage over those companies which are being pushed into this nilly-willy. That framework should contain a transformator like the former Article 42. That gives us additional leverage outside of our jurisdiction. And then the rest is that we should be uh, talking straight language uh, with uh, what is still a, a very important partner and sort out what is acceptable, and sometimes it is, and what is apparently not acceptable, and that is the large-scale uh, surveillance we, we now see reporting. And that is a totally different issue. Uh, what then also remains <coughs> is that there are some things to be improved on the safe harbour as it stands. But it does not justify this at all. Thank you. As Shadow Rapporteur, Mr. Kikov is not in the hall. Frau Ernst, Sie haben das Wort zu fragen. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Okay. I've listened to all of that with mixed feelings, and I'm asking all three of you now to what extent this is the right way to go. I sort of get the feeling, if I may take a populist, a populist example, something like a um, uh, voluntary women's quota. And I'd like to know whether this is the right way to go. Is it basically the way to go? Can we make progress? Can we get some real progress with this uh, going down this path? Um, people say that there's a lot to improve, and, but I'd just like to know whether this is the right path at all, not whether we should improve the path. And if you think it is the right path to go down, then you'd have to uh, tell me how we can make it binding. What real obligatory monitoring uh, do you have? Uh, suggestions for such monitoring. I haven't heard enough about that at all. What about conflict resolution? I think that with the data protection package, that we necessarily need to, to go down this path to solve our problems. Look, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but we need to look, I think, at options, if there are any options at least. Now, the next point I'd like to raise is national security. We've uh, spoken about that at all levels uh, with the data protection package. I don't know how we can solve that particular problem. We can't leave things as they are at the moment, I wouldn't say. We really need to reflect on how uh, we can deal with this issue, particularly at European uh, level, because if we don't, in the end, national security will always be used as a knockout argument, and that's a real problem. Okay, Frau Sommer. Yes? Yes, Central, would you like just, to? just one technical clarification following on from your because we're talking about the national security exemption the whole time. Who's national security? Does I mean is it US national security that justifies the exemption or European or let's say member state mm -hmm. national security? That I don't know. Summer. 
<laughs> yes, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. But, but I think um, the, the first question is really important. And now I understand what you mean. But, but I think Mr. Hastings, he's uh, very right. Certainly, we need this da very um, clear data protection um, rules in Europe for companies who want to act in Europe and who really want to make uh, their money here in Europe. This, is, this must be sure, and this is very good because this, uh, even th this alone um, makes a, a problem to, to companies who have at the same time their rules in in US to be obeyed and the rules in in Germany to, uh, in in U Europe to be obeyed this is a problem and this makes them a lease for us to um, against their own um, uh, authorities that they want they, they they can say to them we have to obey uh, european law so just let us free or something like like this this is um, so this is why uh, european law must be strong and i think we have to have this sign at the moment very urgently because we have this debate and we have to show Europe uh, doesn't want what happens uh, here. Um, but there still rests the situation that European companies want to transfer data to um, US companies and this is uh, the field for something like safe harbor. And certainly it would be better if safe harbor had the same um, Niveau of data protection. This is what uh, data protection often officers will, uh, wish, certainly, and, and this is what we can suggest. But but I think um, only European, uh, a very strong European law wouldn't solve this problem. And um, about national security, I think um, it's meant both. Um, national security is um, it, it's what uh, the U U.S. Uh, authority reached in, in the safe harbor decision that uh, their uh, national security as well is mentioned here as a as a means uh, as a as a, an argument. But we re really have I think we we cannot um, let them uh, let them argue that it is meant as national security that we wouldn't accept without um, a, 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 a suspicion um, for uh, wrongdoing. With a, a mass surveillance is not, uh, cannot be le legitimized um, in a democratic state um, by national security means. No, not in no democratic state, and this is why we shouldn't accept it as an argumentation. Thank you again. We thank you for every effort you make to respond thoroughly to every question, to every single question that is made, but please try to refrain to the minimum, maximum two minutes, because otherwise we're simply running late. Mr. Connolly, your turn to reply. <laughs> okay, very, very briefly, there, there were two questions there. One, one was whether there are ways to improve monitoring conflict resolution to make it more, more, more mandatory. Um, that, that, that would require a lot of work. The, the, one of the big differences between the European and the US approach is that any idea of monitoring or assessment is always outsourced in the US to a private organization, you know, like, like trustee or the Better Business Bureau, et cetera, um, or it's done in-house and self-certified. So there's a massive change before, um, you know, any sort of monitoring of the style, uh, which I think you're talking about, could be included. And the second question, um, just on, you know, with, with national security, whose national security are, are, are we talking about? What is the scope of this national security exemption? Um, it, it's very clear from reading those privacy policies who do talk about national security that they only envisage, you know, lawful, proportional, targeted um, reasons for uh, disclosing information. There's absolutely no indication in you know, any privacy policies or anywhere else in the safe harbour of mass surveillance, um, of, uh, you know, untargeted surveillance. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hastings, please make it short. Yeah, well, one of the merits of safe harbour is that it was the birthplace of what is now binding corporate rules. Um, the difference is, uh, the difference is that in the case of BCRs, there is a European actor which we can hold accountable. 
a big advantage also that BCRs have a wider scope, they apply across the world. But they are quite heavy instruments. So it's also a question of, of, of balancing, uh, balancing um, costs and, and, uh, and merits. Um, what would in the long term be a good approach is that we make the data exporter uh, liable for whatever happens to the data. Uh, that would be an instrument which could help. It could not solve, and, and there we come to the, to the dark problem, we, it could not solve that U.S. law is an overwhelming force on U.S. companies. That is something which can only be fixed in another way. Um, and I would not buy in the, the extensive interpretation of the national security exemption. It's simply unacceptable on the European approaches. So, but that is it's something we cannot solve, um, which we cannot solve either, speaking of security, is that some member states invoke the same exception. And so there is also a discussion we should have in Europe. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm simply sorry that some members that asked for the floor had to leave, but we still have... Members willing to make points, Mrs. Morvai and Mrs. Sippel, I suggest you use your turns now and then we will have a common round for answers from the panel. Okay, Mrs. Morvai. Köszönöm szépen, magyar nyelven uh, szeretnék beszélni. Magyarul fogok beszélni, tehát gondolom, hogy... I'm going to speak Hungarian, says the speaker. The, the European Data Pro I'd like to ask the European Data Protection Office the question, the following question. I have the impression that we are here and saying together, look, there have been a series of bank robberies, and now we should talk about how the victims can be better protected or how they can better protect themselves. But that's not the case. That's not the, the approach we should take. We should actually investigate the facts and find out what the legal consequences of this should be. I would have liked to have heard the three speakers speak about that. So whether the information, the data that Edward Snowden and others have made public, whether you take them as being uh, having veracity, whether they are credible, and whether you think it's uh, right that the NSA has on a massive have massively um, gathered up, collected a lot of data from U.S. from EU citizens. Uh, now, looking into the f we're looking into the future and we're looking into the past. And with that in mind, I'd like to ask our speakers, what would you have reported a year ago at a similar conference? Conference, If we'd had this conference a, a year earlier, what would you have said differently from what you said today? So, specifically, what um, conclusions do you draw from the fact uh, that in the last few months very shocking uh, pieces of information have come out that uh, EU citizens are being illegally gathered and analysed, not only by the NSA but also by the European security agency, agencies. I'd like some concrete and specific answers to these questions and I would also would have liked to be able to uh, ask Vivian, Vivian Redding what the legal consequences of all of this are. I think it's incredible that she's not here this evening. Thank you, Chair. I would like to ask two specific questions. Imagine uh, that we had already passed the European Data Protection Package and that we uh, had high standards in the directive and in the regulation which would apply for all those people outside the EU if they are active on the EU market. 
If that's the case, what would the added value be of safe harbour? Or would it just become redundant? My second question, I have the uh, I, the, I'm getting the idea that we have no monitoring uh, possibilities under safe harbour. Do you think that with this data protection uh, regulation that we will increase uh, the monitoring of standards and also the um, power to apply standards? Would that be uh, better than now under safe harbour? Third question, regardless of the laws we pass on data protection, how necessary do you think uh, that that should uh, be uh, with regard to encryption uh, technique, uh, technology and whether or not we use cloud technology for the saving of our data and do you think it's necessary that as European Union uh, that we should become more active in these uh, areas and more independent from US businesses in order uh, to make it possible technologically for data to be better protected. Final point, as concerns national or internal security, based on your assessment, do we need, addition, in addition to the current uh, rules and regulations, do we need further agreements concerning the rights and the uh, possibilities of um, um, spying uh, services. Thank you. Please return two minutes each because we are way, way behind our schedule. Please, Falsoma. I, I try to. Um, very short about uh, what uh, Edward Snowden said. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm talking as a data protection officer who wants to, uh, to know how, how to react, um, and uh, I really look at the cases, and I, I'm, very, um, I, I'm very happy that in Safe Harbor I only have to, have to see whether there's substantial likelihood, because we, we yet didn't get any evidence, because um, there is, there's still missing uh, the answer from, from the U.S. In, the, in, the, in most cases. This is um, the first. What would I have done uh, one year ago? I think uh, nobody in, 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 this, uh, in this room would have imagined uh, what uh, the extent of, of what uh, happens as, as surveillance, and uh, this is why we, I think, we would have discussed it in another way. We would have discussed, um, yes, uh, we know there are many, uh, many uh, companies who are on this list and they don't be belong to this list and so on, but um, we wouldn't have discussed the, the extent of, of the problem, I think so. And um, yes, would Safe Harbor, um, again, would Safe Harbor um, not be uh, Im Im uh, important if we, we had the um, very good data protection rules in, in Europe? I think they're still missing one, uh, one problem if uh, w what's happening if um, data goes from uh, the territorium of the, um, of the EU uh, European Union to, to other countries, and this is uh, wh what we have in this um, data protection regulation, uh, um, Article 42. This is what, what we think, uh, how, how should we re react to the situation, and we still need um, regulation for this. If it would be a safe harbor or something other, I don't know, but um, it, it should be very strong rules, and, uh, but we, we need uh, some um, yes, the, the question of control. Um, certainly, um, um, the, the European data protection of the European, not only the German ones, really look uh, forward to what will be the regulation um, concerning control. How would it work? We, we didn't experience it. We, we have, have uh, ideas about, uh, from, from what is now, about what could happen with this rule, uh, or regulation, or, or another one. So I, I'm no prophet, uh, so I, I don't know what, what would be better. Um, I think we really have to think very, very exactly about control. This is what we see at this um, safe harbor instrument, uh, the control on, in any case, on the on the U.S. side, didn't uh, didn't work. This is what we know. So I stop here. Thank you, Mr. Connolly.
Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the first questions was uh, whether there could or should be any legal consequences for, for the actors uh, to date. Um, obviously... Oczywiście trudne by to było. Wymagałoby to wiele pracy. Myślę, że nie ma sensu teraz śledzić tego, co było kiedyś, bo jest zbyt wiele do zrobienia na przyszłość. To nie byłoby dobre wykorzystanie zasobów. Mniej więcej... Would the speaker still have the same view? Well, my view on safe harbor is um, very long term. And uh, in fact, we, we wrote to the Federal Trade Commission on May the 9th this year um, flagging concerns with Trustmarks and Safe Harbour and uh, Edward Snowden I hadn't heard of on May the 9th. Uh, he was revealed later that month. Um, and the, the only other question I'll address out of those was um, uh, is, is the Safe Harbour redundant after, um, after the regulation? Uh, obviously that would be you know, potentially a good outcome for, for Europe if the regulation was, uh, you know, had that capacity. Um, it, it does seem unlikely, uh, but obviously there are, there's the whole rest of the world, not just Europe and, and the US to think about, um, with many new countries passing privacy laws, which also restrict transfer of data to countries where protection isn't adequate. Um, the real problem is not the strength of the European law, it's the strength or lack of strength of the US law um, when they're collecting data from so many different countries, not, not just Europe. Thank you. Mr. Hutzings, make it short. Which, uh, which, question do you, which question do you want me to skip? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm trying to, try to catch up because yes, we're running so yes. much late. So I was trying to. Um, I, I'm not in a position to, to determine uh, what Edward Snowden has revealed is all correct. I'm assuming it may well be correct and we're investigating all the consequences to, to come to a position, what we should be doing. It's plausible to assume that those who have been most instrumental in this whole affair are wide outside of European jurisdiction. And those who are within jurisdiction, we have currently weak instruments to face them. And that is a reason why we should be revising our frameworks, introducing stronger instruments so that the Microsofts, the Apples, and the Facebooks, and all the others who are, are in the middle can be addressed in a more appropriate way. If we extend our scope of jurisdiction, we can apply that jurisdiction and make it, make it, to, to, uh, make it good use of this. What we cannot solve is that the reality of the rest of the world, data are moving around. And so we need mm -hmm. the principle of adequacy to either find it structural in a form, a country or an arrangement is adequate according to the criteria we apply, or we provide adequacy ad hoc via contracts, BCR, etc. In all of those cases, we cannot, unfortunately, prevent that in a third country, be it India, China, Brazil, or you name it, the United States, or in Canada, things happen which we do not agree with. And that is a something which we cannot solve here tonight, and not in the review, but we should not be not doing what we can do. That, that's essential. Encryption is a very good idea, but I read in the newspapers that there are backdoors, and that's one of the problems. So we need to, building trust, European clouds, European approaches, yes, but I read in the newspaper that Belgacom is also infected. So there is really a mess we need to sort out. Thank you all three. We thank you all three. Summer, Mr. Connolly, Mr. Hastings, we thank you all. We, we, we reckon it's not easy to take so many questions and then trying to summarize and refrain to the minimum, the shortest possible when answering. But we thank you for your efforts. Of course, we thank you for being here. Thank you for your contribution to the discussion and work ahead of the, of the Libya inquiry we're conducting. And now we move on to the, sec to the second statement. It's, it's going to be a single person sta uh, panel. The, the ladies, Mrs. Isabel Falk. Perrotin. She's the president of the CNEEL France. I guess it's the uh, Comité National pour l'Informatique et la Liberté. Pour l'Informatique et la Liberté. We thank you for being here. We, we, you, we will.
be attending your presentation for the next 10 minutes. So you got the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I was going to think you'd forgotten me. So, good evening, everyone. And thank you for giving the floor to a national data protection body. Following on from what my German colleague said, this will allow me to share with you our comments on the PRISM case relative to um, the standard contractual clauses that have been mentioned and the binding corporate rules, the BCRs. Let me start by setting the scene, looking at the atmosphere. They may be hopeful, helpful um, in gauging the proposals I'm about to make to you. The revelations in the PRISM case really set off a shockwave in France. The CNIL, our commission, was approached by four major human rights organizations and uh, the representatives of the various branches of the judiciary asking us what we intended to do to protect the rights of European citizens. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, the general feeling in France was that a red line had been crossed. And regardless of the goal of fighting terrorism, that couldn't possibly justify indiscriminate uh, blanket surveillance of ordinary citizens. Now, that said, the question put to the G29 and the Working Party in our Commission, CNIL as we call it, is whether the, the current contractual arrangements for international uh, data exchange, standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules, could have countenance these practices or whether they could have imposed sufficient limits to provide proper guarantees for European citizens. Now, with all due reserve flowing from the fact that the work has not yet been completed, and also bearing in mind that we're not familiar with the full extent of PRISM's arrangements, I, I will try and sketch out a reply to the question that's been put to us. And then, at a further stage, I will try and suggest a few lines of subsequent action which might provide a partial reply to the questions put by members just now. So, first of all, the existing contractual tools as we have them today to provide a framework for international data transfer. Because we're not that familiar with uh, the makeup of PRISM, the G29 working group was working on the basis of two scenarios which will allow us to illustrate the issues arising. The first of these scenarios sees data being collected and stored in Europe by one of the major internet players and then a request being put by the American authorities for that data to be transferred. The second scenario is where the, the data is collected in, in Europe and transferred to the US to be stored and it's there in the US that the American authorities request access to it. Now, in scenario one, the contractual tools as we have them today don't provide you with any reply. They're not intended to govern data transfers to public authorities. The tools were set up and implemented for the purpose of governing data transfer within private firms. We made no provision for national authorities signing up to codes of conduct, the binding corporate rules, the BCRs as people call them, or bilateral uh, contracts with other authorities, the standard contractual clauses. So in scenario one, the SCCs and the BCRs are useless, whereas in scenario two, the standard contractual clauses and binding will allow you to govern the transfer of data to a third country, the US in this instance. And they do allow for further transfers. However, conditions are applied to those subsequent transfers. There has to be proportionality in the transfer. The people should be informed. 
and the, the purpose of the data transfer should be the same as at the first stage. In particular, you would not be authorised to communicate the data to third parties for purposes incompatible with the initial purpose of data compilation. Furthermore, the final recipient of the data must enter into a commitment to respect European rules. In the instance of BCRs and standard contractual clauses, we have a very complex position. There's a degree of flexibility here, provided that European rules are respected, and that applies in particular to the requirement in Article 25 of the Directive, whereby a proper level of data protection must be ensured right throughout the working life of the data, including at the time of international transfer. The question then arises as to whether those contractual instruments in Scenario 2 might have been used for the kind of access that PRISM was involved with. Theoretically speaking, there's nothing to preclude that. Insofar as the NSA, or whichever US authority might be, respected the principles I've just cited. We might wonder, however, whether in the light of national law and order requirements under US legislation, which grant waivers to uh, standard contractual requirements of data importers, whether there really would be any room for manoeuvre. Similarly, the question will arise as to who is responsible for, for what. Is the importer of data or the exporter responsible for given provisions? Now, the requirements of the directive and the BCRs, particularly the uh, requirement to in inform the, the, the person whose data is being used, are subject to particular waivers, but they, they can't be confined to to one or, or several particular people. Though there can't be any massive transfer of data because that is out of kilter with the, uh, the principle of proportionality in European data protection legislation. So we can see that the legal debate, and I've, I've, I've only just sketched it out, is very complex in both these scenarios, but it seems that BCRs and standard contractual clauses are constructed in such a way that they're not adequate to solve the problems of requests for access to data by foreign authorities seeking to uh, obtain data of EU citizens, nor are they an adequate response to the issue of past surveillance from foreign powers. Having said that, let us try to think about some possible ways of finding solutions. Now, the European response to PRISM seems to be as, as much a political or industrial one as um, a legal one. And it's important, and this has been underscored on a number of occasions by previous speakers, for the reform of the data protection framework in Europe to come to a head swiftly so that Europe can show it's united in defending its uh, uh, values on the digital world in our dealings with the US and the rest of the world. The current negotiations or, or disputes in, in relation to a given country or, or economic players will uh, be strongly affected by this. Now, to be specific, picking up the problem mentioned earlier on of the superiority of US uh, law and order provisions over contractual obligations, this instrument or, or an equivalent instrument should set out the conditions governing data transfer to public authorities abroad. To that end, the former paragraph 42 regarding access to European citizens' uh, data by um, authorities in third countries should be reincorporated. A number of MEPs have tabled amendments uh, heading in that direction so that the monitoring authorities would be uh, empowered to decide whether or not to allow the transfer of data to the uh, national to traditional authorities of the third country. Canil supports Article 42. I might argue, however, that if you had case-by-case um, -case authorization of a particular European citizen's data being, being transferred might be too cumbersome. But it would be perfectly conceivable to uh, envisage some sort of sexual authorization system whereby the, the national surveillance authorities could list, uh, release lists of 
citizens whose data had been compiled by the initial member state. In addition, specific agreements with third countries on access to European citizens' data by their authorities are vital if we are to um, address any possible legal disputes. And the European institutions clearly have a vital role in working out and negotiating this legal framework which should protect our citizens. However, no agreement can provide legitimacy for the sort of uh, process we saw in PRISM, given uh, what we gather to have, have happened, according to information that's been brought into the public domain. Any action must be in line with the provisions of the Fundamental Charter of Rights in the ECHR. That means in particular that any attack on citizens' private lives must be confined to the necessary minimum with respect to the principle of proportionality. According to our tradition, we, we cannot have um, indiscriminate blanket surveillance of the, the population. And we, we can't have um, data being uh, systematically hoovered up on mass. Any international agreements, therefore, should not be allowed to um, provide any legitimacy after the fact for, the, for this kind of uh, blanket data mining. So the Commission's current proposal uh, implies that it would be the country where the, the firm has its main headquarters that would take the decisions. There's therefore uh, a risk of companies moving their headquarters to particular, particular countries. Uh, only the authorities of that, that country would be able to decide on the basis of Article 42 whether or not data could be transferred to a third country. That's why on, on the basis of the February agreement in the G29, uh, uh, France is proposing a more decentralised system which would allow the authorities involved to adopt common measures while retaining the, the, the power to protect their citizens' rights. Lastly, we, we should uh, see growing interest in the idea of uh, a national or European sovereign cloud that would uh, allow us to cut, cut down the exposure of, of data to third countries and uh, respond to growing demands from European citizens. So, there, Madam Chairman, a, a few initial pointers that uh, the G29 group have etched out, fleshed out by some more specific uh, recommendations from CNIL. I think it's necessary for Europe to come out with a strong response to the, the PRISM case, which illustrates the risk of the surveillance society that has been adumbrated by a number of speakers. I think it's extremely important in this context for there to be democratic scrutiny set up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you gave us plenty of food for thought. Uh, you certainly gave me food for thought. Um, I'm going to uh, invite the rapporteur, first of all, to ask the first question. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a specific question and then a general question. First of all, the general question, which is obviously we've had a, a very compelling sort of destruction of safe harbour, so I want to ask you as well from the French experience uh, whether you would favour a complete re renegotiation of safe harbour or what your wider perspective is given what you've heard today, perhaps just in a nutshell. Um, and secondly, I just want to ask you about the um, issue of cloud computing g given the senile experience. Um, given that we have an autonomous, um, a lack of an autonomous European cloud computing capacity, could you comment on whether you see the binding corporate rules or standard contractual clauses as a viable solution as laid down in Article 43 of the Data Protection Regulation? Casper Bowden in his, um, I don't know if you've seen the study that he prepared for the European Parliament, but he um, 
saw this as a strategy for the Commission and the DPAs to maintain their semblance of legal control of EU and for the cloud providers who find existing EU data protection regimes inconvenient. I don't know if you saw the, his study. Um, would you agree with his analysis um, if you had seen his, his report? And also, would you agree that within cloud computing, European governments would follow the lead of Sweden and confine data to the EU pending a viable legal solution uh, for this issue? Um, those are my two questions. Thank you. Mrs. Falk? As far as cloud computing is concerned, the CNIL and other authorities for some time now has taken the view that the level of requirements attached to the safe harbour system wasn't adequate. And we made uh, approaches to the FTC to establish precisely in which cases it had in ensured that the safe harbour rules had been respected. And the reply we got from the FTC wasn't terribly convincing. So I believe that there is scope for Im improving the safe harbour system and the level of re requirements attached to it. But whether it be the safe harbour or what I've just said about standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules, I believe that these tools were not devised to deal with the kind of issue we're seeing today, whether this concern of, of national security and access to data on national security grounds. So we shouldn't, if you will, weaken tools which are working to some extent to turn them to a purpose which w wasn't initially intended for them. So on the issue of data gathering uh, and transfer for European citizens, we need to come up with something new. That's why we think that negotiating an agreement on this specific issue between Europe and third countries is likely to provide a better response. Although, of course, it's perfectly conceivable that we might have a link amongst these various instruments. We might uh, imagine that within the binding corporate rules and the safe harbour, a reference might be made to such an ad hoc agreement. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we keep an eye on the clock, and I'm asking everybody to really st stick to two minutes and, and no more, so everybody will have their time. Mr. Voss, on behalf of the EPP. Thank you. Thank you for your explanations. We're dealing here with the massive uh, spying on uh, data with a sort of a uh, national uh, organization which um, looks at data, personal data directly and also on businesses' uh, data. And so if you um, work with the third countries to uh, come to an agreement, you're going to end up in a different legal environment where the sovereignty of the uh, countries play an important role. And that is why I think that this type of spying, not the commercial spying, but the um, intelligence services are spying is something that we can only uh, manage if we have international agreements. Do you share my view? Mrs. Falk? Translation takes some time. <laughs> Alors, I'm not uh, je, je, je suis pas sûr que je comprends bien votre question. I'm not sure. Uh, sorry. I'm not sure I fully understood your question because we have a situation today where we have surveillance infrastructure in place which is extremely sophisticated and that was set up initially by private actors in order to meet trade uh, needs. Now this infrastructure it transpires is now being used by public authorities to data mine for other reasons, for other purposes. 
notably intelligence purposes. So I think we've got to draw a line between these two separate situations, these separate scenarios. What PRISM needs is to clearly create a framework for public authority access to uh, data for their intelligence work. And what I want to say at this stage is that the transfer tools, the international transfer tools that were designed to meet company and business needs are not designed really for public authority access to those data. They need to be improved. They have to set out what derogations and so on need to be uh, established. But there won't be enough guarantees, I don't think, to be able to use those rules for public access. So if we really want to give European citizens true guarantees, then we have to come up with something specific. We have to negotiate a specific uh, agreement, an intergovernmental agreement between Europe and the United States, for instance. Uh, and then later on, we've got to think very carefully about what kind of instrument we would come up with. But we certainly need a specific agreement on that issue. And in any case, any agreement on this it's very important at this point, cannot be a pretext or an excuse for mass surveillance of European citizens. Certainly not. It might give a f legal framework for specific access, limited access, which is authorized. But certainly, and this was said by previous speakers, there must not be uh, systematic surveillance uh, of European citizens. We, we really have to try and, and stay within the two minutes. Okay, I myself will take the floor on behalf of the, the, the elder group um, very rapidly. First of all, I come back to my question on the national security exemption, and I'm not sure if it was answered by Mr. Hustings, otherwise I didn't understand. But an exemption for national security means that within a particular jurisdiction, so within the context of national law, national security considerations can take precedence over other considerations. It does not mean, in my view, that national security considerations of one jurisdiction can take precedence over the law of another jurisdiction. It doesn't mean that. And in this context, I would like to ask you a very precise question. We've just learned that um, the Russian government is, intends to do mass surveillance. Uh, somebody said this is a prism on steroids. Um, in, uh, in the run-up to Sochi, to the Olympic Games. I mean, if you apply the logic of the national security exemption in the way we do it with the US, then there is really nothing we can do. Uh, another question I'd like to ask is uh, about, I mean, I know the French government was outraged about, uh, about prison, but it is my understanding that the French Secret Service has something similar. Can you say a little bit more about what CNIL I said about that. And finally, you, you talked about a European cloud, um, but I, I think others have also mentioned it. Isn't it true that that will not solve the problem? Because the problem is one of a politico-legal nature and not a technical nature. Um, uh, you know, there are many data which are stored on European territory, but the Americans consider it falls within their jurisdiction and they use the Patriot Act or even Medicare or FATCA or you name it to get access to the data so European cloud is not going to help us. Well, I'll just be brief in responding to the last question. That's not the case. If you have a European cloud or a French cloud or a German cloud, which in capital terms is 100% European, and the FISA law won't apply to that cloud. So that means that the American or foreign authorities will not legally have access to the data held in the cloud. So, well, that's at least our analysis of the situation. And we think that to an extent that does protect European citizens' data. And this isn't a problem regarding the location of the store or the storage of this, these data. It's a problem as to whether or not the business concerned is subject to American law. If you have a business which is 100% European, which works for the European market, 
then there is absolutely no justification for an American foreign public authority to request access to the data. Secondly, the argument regarding national security. Well, you're quite right there. Uh, and that's why I was saying what I was saying earlier on. Uh, if you have an American data importer, which in the interest of national security is asked by the American authorities to hand over data collected in Europe, then that business actually cannot refuse that request. So there, you'll have a situation where contractual obligations which apply to the American data importer, which say that the company has to follow a certain number of rules, will not apply because in the interest of national security, that company has to communicate the data to the NSA or somebody else. So that means that national law and international security interests will prevail. And that is why we have to have a legal instrument which operates at the same level as uh, these legal or rather national requirements. It has to be an international legal agreement so that we can prevent those things from happening. Then, thirdly, let's forget about PRISM. I would just like to know, so you're saying that there's nothing we can do against Mr. Putin and it's mass surveillance for Sochi. Je dis que on... Well, I'm just saying that if this is a national instrument or provision in Russia, which says that in the interest of national security in Russia, uh, uh, a data, a Russian data importer of data collected from European citizens to hand over that data to the Russian authorities, well, the company in question would have a very great difficulty rejecting that request. So we would only be able to solve this if people had recourse to a higher level of legal agreement to be able to say no. Two minutes. Thank you. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit puzzled also now. Um, we are talking about, I mean, or uh, I, I say it that way. It's, it's clear that we uh, are not able to change third states' laws uh, from here. Um, also, I wonder a bit, I mean, if everybody really believes that we will get international agreements on data protection f from today to tomorrow, I don't believe in that really. My experiences on the negotiations uh, of the framework agreement between the European Union and the United States are not that positive. Just to state that very clearly, we are after three years of negotiations and we are nowhere. And I mean, this is about the question if a third state like the United States of America, which is a close partner to us, is changing its existing laws because obviously these surveillance activities are, activities are laid down in laws and legal, uh, where changing any law at the moment is completely, I mean, unrealistic obviously. Uh, so it, it seems to be very blank to just say, let's just go for international agreement. We need to uh, think about the question, what to do right now about this. And then I get to the point of the uh, binding corporate rules, because I'm, I'm not sure if I, uh, if I got um, the situation right now, uh, also with regard to what we uh, negotiate in the regulation, uh, because isn't it also, like with the safe harbor agreement, a problem to just go ahead with uh, having binding corporate rules uh, as a possibility to exchange data across the jurisdictions. And how do we hinder binding corporate rules to get the same problem or to bring the same problems like we have on safe harbor today? That would be important for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Falk. I'm asking you kindly to, to please stick to the two minutes, not because it's not important what we have to say, but we have to, to end before 9.30 because the interpreters will leave. Je crois qu'on peut éventuellement... Well, I think we could perhaps beef up the BCRs. That's a possibility. But as I said, the BCRs 
are not enough in themselves to provide guarantees when it comes to requests from foreign authorities uh, in the interests of uh, intelligence. Uh, so it's not necessarily about creating international agreements, but what we want is to have the possibility in Europe of establishing the guarantees that we want to have for European situa citizens in these kinds of situations. So we want to have you know, regulations, uh, a legislative uh, backdrop like Article 42, so that the requests that may come in from uh, a foreign body or authority can be properly dealt with. So it's not about negotiating an international agreement. But we want to have in the regulation a proper provision for this so that the American data importer facing, in, well, subject to contractual obligations and then having to face um, demands from uh, the American authorities in the interests of national security will be able to turn around and actually deal with that risk, risk, risk or question whilst at the same time guaranteeing the rights of European citizens. And of course, we also need to have some sort of ad hoc agreement to deal with um, disputes and to settle those disputes, because there will be disputes in terms of legislation which applies. And in order to deal with those disputes, we need to have an ad hoc agreement between the United States and the European Union and other third countries where necessary. We are being absent. Mrs. Ernst for GUE. Vielen Dank. Many thanks. Uh, two things on my mind. First is national security. That has a national uh, component, but you cannot exclude that it also has a European component. So we cannot really separate the two for as far as I'm concerned. But still, there are differences. Uh, there's a national law, and that needs to be dealt with at European level. So how do you see national security in that context? And to what extent can we um, settle things at European level in order to uh, get our, find our way out of this uh, difficult situation? The second thing, uh, con treaties that are not respected, fully respected, should we um, make threats? Should we simply uh, ignore those uh, treaties? Uh, what do we do with international law and treaties when we're looking at things such as safe harbour? Uh, what happens when we sort of walk all over, tread all over international law and, and international treaties? Um, should we not be tougher when these international treaties are not respected? Should we, for example, cancel the treaties? Well, on national security, I think you're right. There is a national component and, of course, a European component. Germany has come up with a proposal which says that they would like, at European level, to be able to work on a kind of joint approach for intelligence services, and we're very much in favor of that, European cooperation on this issue. Then, as to the current treaties and what we need to do to be able to deal with the rather negative uh, situation that has been pointed to here and there, well, it depends on the instrument. The safe harbor decision is an instrument that has uh, not new. It's been around for a while. Vivian Redding herself said that uh, if we don't renegotiate it, we certainly have to drastically improve it. Then the BCRs, well, they are more recent uh, innovations, tools, which took time to be set up. And to my mind, I think they set out obligations to all stakeholders, which I think are really very demanding when it comes to audits, uh, accountability, and checks and controls. So I think in themselves they're good tools. But once again, I would say that these tools are not designed to deal with a problem like PRISM. They're tools which were conceived to deal with international flows uh, involving um, 
private stakeholders, private companies. So it's important to be clear. These tools are not enough in themselves to deal with the problems that we face. We need to add something else to the uh, equation. Mrs. Morvai for two minutes. <coughs> Elnézést, akkor előről kezdeném, tehát kérdezném mind a három elő előadót. I would like to ask a question of all three speakers. May I speak Hungarian? I've uh, heard that there is no Hungarian translation. I'd like to speak Hungarian if that's possible. Okay, good, we have translation, good. My question is the, the, the following. Do we have any uh, real reasons to worry about Putin and uh, Russia? Because in the future, we will be faced with a situation in which Putin and uh, Russia will spy on European citizens, in spite of the fact that we uh, know about Putin and Russia, that they were the ones who gave Edward Snowden political asylum. And that's the reason that we're sitting here and debating these whole, this whole uh, set of issues. Because in spite of the fact that he, as whistleblower, probably would have ended up in Guantanamo Bay. Mm, for 30 years, 35 years, or a life sentence. So I don't know whether we really need to worry uh, about Putin and Russia. We should actually thank Putin and Russia for the help that they've given Snowden. We really don't know what Russia will do in the future, but what Russia has done and what the USA and certain Western countries have done, we know exactly what they've done. So we've heard what the French have done. We know how the French spied on European citizens. And I think we should talk more about that and not so much about Russia and Putin. So I'd like to hear our French uh, colleague um, hear what our French colleague has to say about the illegal activities of the French uh, intelligence authorities. Regardless of who is doing mass surveillance, Mrs. Falk? Well, I think the question regarding Putin or any question relating to a public authority abroad, these aren't new issues at the CNIL in March this year, so well before the PRISM scandal, we set up a group to look at this issue of all requests coming through for French citizens' data coming from uh, foreign authorities, American, Russian, etc. And there's so much legislation available, actually, to foreign authorities to come to us, uh, to France, and ask for uh, the data of French citizens. So the question has been raised now. This is a really thorny issue, and we have to think about it very carefully. We have to think about what kind of response Europe is going to give. And we think that Article 42 in the regulation is uh, an interesting way for us to be able to respond. Now, as regards the French situation now, in France, and this has been seen in other countries, of course, there are intelligence services doing their work. So what we said to our government was the following. We said, that, and I spoke to the Interior Minister and the Defence Minister myself on this, because we said that we would like to know if uh, an instrument like PRISM existed in France. And to date, we haven't actually received any specific, precise information in response. But what we have said is that these kinds of instrument need extra control uh, by data protection authorities. And we have said that we'd like to have more oversight, more control over any such an instrument, because we have oversight over police files today, but for certain things, other areas, we have limited control. 
uh, not just by samples, for example, but our control is limited. So we have asked for heightened control to be exercised by our uh, organization if such instruments exist in France. Merci beaucoup. I'm beginning to feel that the term demande d'accès is, is a euphemism. It's not really a polite request. Eh? <laughs> Um, and to reassure you, Mrs. Morvai, there will be sessions dedicated to the activities of the, uh, the European National Secret Services, which are, are similar. So they're not, going, they're not off the hook or anything. Huh? Um, I'm going to invite uh, our rapporteur to um, make some concluding remarks. Um, and I'm kindly asking the uh, interpreters to have patience for five more minutes, Max, and then we can all go for dinner. Still not working. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chair. Um, the uh, the Snowden leaks uh, threw into sharp relief the um, the inadequacies of safe harbour, but the fundamental flaws were always there. And the session we have currently had, apart from the absence of the Commissioner, I think have been quite compelling in in suggesting that safe harbour is deeply flawed and and why. I think in particular, though, I would isolate the, um, the witness testimony of um, Mr. Connolly. I think this was a systematic destruction of safe harbour. I don't think any of my uh, colleagues would disagree with that. And I think for that reason, um, we are clear, and I think I can speak for all my colleagues, that the agreement lacks compliance um, on all counts in relation to transparency and enforcement on every level. It was signed into force in 2004. It's incompatible with the highest uh, standards of protection that exist in the EU under the Lisbon Treaty, under the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and as many people have been pointing out on Twitter, even the ECHR. It's clear then that the Safe Harbour Agreement doesn't offer any of our EU citizens uh, protection against either FISA or the Patriot Act in the US. It can no longer be considered to be a viable mechanism for cross-border flows from the EU to the US. And as a result, I think I'm on safe ground to say that this committee of inquiry, uh, while it may make conclusions at the end of the inquiry, should firmly say now that we would call on the Commission to suspend the Safe Harbour Agreement, pending a full review on whether the US companies can still comply with it. If the Commissioner was here today, we would say that to her, but as this is web streamed, that's what the committee of inquiry is calling for, and that's what I as rapporteur am calling for, a suspension of the Safe Harbour Agreement. Thank you. I think that conclusion is crystal clear. Um, all right, colleagues, um, that concludes the session of today. I've uh, misplaced my notes, so I cannot announce. Ah, next meeting is uh, Monday, October 14th in Brussels, so that's next Monday. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to the interpreters. <laughs>